This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at Emmanuel Lutheran Church on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Pastor Ann Palma, and it is my joy to welcome you, whether you're joining us from near or from far. If you have any prayer requests, any questions about the congregation, or if you would like to send in a donation, uh, inf contact information for this congregation are included on this video. Next Sunday, we anticipate opening a special worship service at Touchmark in Meridian and uh, having those members of our congregation that live there worship with us. We ask for your prayers for that service and that everyone will rejoice at this new opportunity to praise our God. I have been asked by members of the congregation how we can respond to the recent natural disasters, Hurricane Ian in particular, that affected parts of the United States and Cuba. As always, ELCA Lutheran disaster response is a great way to practically help our neighbors who are in need. You can donate online at Lutheran Disaster Response, and we encourage you to do that even as so many people have been devastated by loss of homes and possessions. During this season of harvest, we give thanks to God in gratitude for all the material blessings God has given us. At this time, Barb Condon will share a message with us on that topic of gratitude. Hi, I'm Barbara Condon, a member of Emanuel Lutheran, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about gratitude and why I give to Emanuel. And I learned a long time ago when I first became a pastor that I needed to start tithing as a pastor. Um, and that was to be a role model for parishioners to tithe, and so I began to tithe. But then I, the more I thought about why I give to the church, I realized it doesn't, I don't give to keep the lights on or uh, keep the heat on or even pay my salary when I was a working pastor. Um, I give because of all the blessings that God has blessed me with. Uh, it's, it's out of gratitude to God. Um, so I, when I write the check, whichever church I'm writing to, um, I write the check for God um, to say thank you for the blessings in my life. And yes, it does help the church um, keep the lights on and pay the pastor, but it also helps do the ministry beyond our walls um, and allows the church to reach out uh, to help other people. So that's, that's why I write a check, um, but also stewardship isn't just about writing checks. It's also about giving your time, my time, my talents, whatever I can offer. Um, and so in times when I didn't have very much money and couldn't give very much, um, I could still give a lot in my time and my talents. And all of that's important. It's not about amounts, but it's about giving back what God has first given us. Um, and that's for me what it is, giving back what God has first given me. Please join me in the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. 
Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear this good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. Cry out with joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him, sing before him singing for joy. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. Know that he, the Lord, is God. He made us we belong to Him. We are His people, the sheep of His flock. His people, the sheep of His flock. We are His people, the sheep of His flock. We are His people, the sheep of His Indeed, how good, how good is the Lord, eternal His merciful love. He is faithful from age to age, He is faithful from age to age. We are His people, the sheep of his flock, we are his people, the sheep of his flock. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, your bountiful goodness fills all creation. Keep us safe from all that may hurt us, that whole and well in body and spirit, we may with grateful hearts accomplish all that you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The first reading is from 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn, torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elijah's house. Elisha sent a messenger, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Pharpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Someone once asked Martin Luther to describe the nature of true worship, and his answer was this, the leper turning back. Martin Luther found the essence of true worship in the story of that 10th leper, seeing himself healed and turning back to praise God and to thank Jesus. True worship consists of gratitude and praise. Keep this in mind as we hear today's good news. Once upon a time, there was no leprosy in the world. There was no disease of any kind, and there was no death. People were whole and wonderful just as God had created them. Sin entered the world, and all this changed. Once upon a time, there was no Samaria and no Galilee, but only a kingdom called Israel. The people sinned and the kingdom fell. 
Invaders from the East brought with them destruction and deportation and division, so that when the invading empire eventually fell, as all empires eventually do, there was not one kingdom but two lands, Samaria in the south, Galilee in the north, with an invisible but indivisible wall between them. Division came where there had once been unity. By Jesus' time, Samaritans and Galileans had been feuding for so long that it seemed hard to remember that they had all, at one time, been one people. Shared blood had become bad blood. A good Galilean Jew would think twice before even setting foot in Samaritan territory because the borderlands were bad lands. The enmity ran deep. And it's precisely in these bad lands, this border zone between Galilee and Samaria, that Jesus led his disciples as he was on his way to Jerusalem to die. Ten sick people called out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Ten people found their unity in the misery of a skin disease which made them outcasts, unclean. A unity not in the identity of Galilean or Samaritan, but a unity in the label, leper. Ten sick people cried out to Jesus, and ten dirty people were made clean. Ten sick people were made clean, and one turned back. Ten suffering people were given enough faith to be physically healed. They had enough faith to trust Jesus' word and to obey Jesus' instructions quite literally. Go and show yourself to the priests. One of them had enough faith to trust and to obey Jesus' word and enough faith to see that this healing was more than skin deep. One turned back to give thanks to Jesus and praise to God. Ten people were physically healed. One of them was saved. And he was a Samaritan. A half-breed, so it was said, a heretic, so it was thought, and a foreigner. He was saved. Last week, we explored what it means to have faith. This week, let's talk about what it means to be saved. Some of us think that being saved means spending eternity in the presence of God after we die. If you believe that, you believe the truth. There's plenty of biblical witness to support this definition of salvation. Jesus himself promises abundant and eternal life to all who believe in him. But if that's all you believe about being saved you are missing out. Because according to Jesus himself, there's a lot more to salvation than eternal life. Salvation is not just for the there and then, but also for the here and now, for all of us who have been given eyes to see what Jesus has already accomplished for us and hearts to respond with gratitude and praise. In Luke's gospel alone, being saved is often for the here and now. Zechariah the priest in chapter 1, when he learns that he will become father to John the Baptist, prophesies that God's people will be saved from their enemies and sings that God's people will have knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. So salvation is also about rescue from enemies, deliverance, and about forgiveness from sin, another deliverance. In chapter 19, 
which we will consider in more detail on Reformation Sunday, Jesus comes into Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus, that rich man, that wee little man, the chief tax collector, is converted on the spot. He promises to give away half his wealth and to make restitution to everyone he has cheated. Hearing this, Jesus doesn't say, good work, Zacchaeus, I'll see you in heaven someday. Instead, Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house. So being saved is also about transformation and about generosity and about restoring right relationships, righting wrongs, and establishing justice here and now. But salvation is about even more than that. Four times in Luke's gospel, Jesus announces salvation as a done deal, something already accomplished by faith here and now. Four times in Luke's gospel, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. And three of these times, salvation comes in the form of the healing of bodies. The womb of a woman who was suffering from a hemorrhage. The eyes of a blind beggar sitting by the side of the road to Jericho. And the leprous skin of a doubly outcast Samaritan foreigner who turns back to Jesus with thanks and turns to God with praise. Salvation means eternal life in the by and by, and it also means protection, deliverance, forgiveness, generosity, reconciliation, and justice in the here and now. And when your eyes are opened to the wonder of God's salvation now, the natural response is gratitude, thanks to Jesus and praise to God, true worship, undefiled, turning back, honoring God with all that we are, with all that we have, and with all that we hope to be and become. The man from Samaria saw that his skin was healed, and in seeing he was saved. Right now, you may be looking back at the gospel text and wondering about it, and if you were here with me, you might be saying, Pastor Anne, the word saved doesn't show up anywhere in this text. You're right. It doesn't show up in the New Revised Standard Version. But Luke wrote in first century Greek and not 21st century English. And the word he used, sozo, can be and has been rightly translated saved. Listen to some English translations through the years of verse 19. Thy faith hath made thee safe. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Your faith has restored you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. All these things are true. Salvation is about safety and wholeness and restoration and healing and wellness. The healed man became aware of a reality that was present all along. The veil was lifted from his eyes, and he was given the gift of seeing Jesus as he truly is, someone with the power to heal bodies, but more than that, someone with the power to save in the fullest sense of the word. And he was grateful. Seeing the truth, he turned back and gave thanks and praise. And he was happy. Lutheran theologian Mark Allen Powell has said that grateful people are the second happiest people on earth. Sometime soon I'll share with you what Mark Allen Powell has to say about who are the first happiest people on earth. But for this week, let's rejoice that grateful people are the second happiest In this discussion, second place is not a bad place to land. The world today, as always, 
is a challenging place. And it can be hard to feel grateful in a world full of troubles. I worry about a lot of things, and I know that you do too. Some of us struggle with personal or interpersonal challenges, troubles with illnesses, relationships, finances, that interfere with what we imagine is the abundant life Jesus promised. Some of us are troubled by different issues. I wonder what keeps you up at night. Concerns about climate change, about the aftermath of a pandemic that has cost millions of lives around the world, or gun violence, and the fear and the hatred that feed it. Our conspiracy theories that sow doubt and division. Or the question about whether this fine experiment of a democratic republic that we call the United States of America is about to come to an end. Or the conflicts that have created conditions where tens of millions of displaced people seek refuge far from home, or simply the opportunity to return home. It is impossible to imagine giving thanks for these circumstances, and thanks be to God, God does not command us to give thanks for these circumstances, but rather in these circumstances and in all circumstances because God is good, and God knows what troubles us, and God has not left us alone. And thanks be to God that our world, though filled with troubles, is also filled with blessing. David Lowe shares his favorite list, and you may find some of your favorites on this list as well. Families that care for each other, colleagues who work hard and well, Schools where teachers care about their pupils and students are eager to learn. A form of government that is far from perfect, yet strives to honor its citizens by conveying a level of freedom and opportunity rarely imagined. Relief agencies that tend the afflicted. Service people who regularly put their lives on the line at home and abroad good neighbors who support one another, and a community of faith where the word is preached and the life of faith is nourished. For this and for so much more, we are bound to give thanks. Jesus healed the bodies of 10 people, restoring them to community, and one of those 10 was given faith to turn back in gratitude and praise. In other words, one of them was saved. From salvation comes gratitude that shows up as thanks and praise. And today, because I am saved, I give thanks to Jesus and praise to God for each of you who have ministered faithfully in this congregation and shown what it means to be followers of Jesus. I give thanks for all the ministers who do their work unseen, those who tend to all the details, great and small, that move us forward in mission for the ones who pull the crabgrass, the ones who lead our song, count our offerings, keep the office running, minister to our elders and to our young ones, assist in leading worship. I give thanks for the ones who prepare God's table for our Holy Communion meal and the ones who prepare a community table each Tuesday night to feed our neighbors. I give thanks for the infant voices that sing out their praise during worship, for the hospitality of those who provide a welcome for all our guests, and for those guests who have joined this congregation because of that holy hospitality. I give thanks because I know you will forgive me for not naming today all of the ministries that you give to God as members and friends of this congregation. 
I give thanks because all of these ministries are your response, your turning back to a loving God who has freed you from sin, protected you, healed you, restored you to right relationships, called you to do justice, and given you faith that has saved you. May your faith be contagious. May your gratitude become epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. More than that, thank God for you. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your church in every land with its diversity of people and worship. Inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your gospel faithfully, that all may come to follow you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Majestic God, we give you thanks for land and water, sunshine and soil, We pray for an abundant harvest in this and every land and for wisdom to care for your creation even as it cares for us. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Mighty God, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, and world who yearn for and work for justice and peace. As we in the United States mark the arrival of Europeans in this land a few hundred years ago, We also ask your blessing on the indigenous peoples among us whose ancestors lived and died for thousands of years before. Inspire everyone who follows your son to seek justice for those who are the last, the lost, the least, and the little among us. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of those in need. Today we pray for everyone in our community who slept at the Boise Rescue Mission or Interfaith Sanctuary last night, for those who slept outdoors, for women and children made homeless by domestic violence, for gay teenagers made homeless when their families reject them, for veterans made homeless by mental illness or substance abuse, and for the elderly made homeless by poverty. Give them the dignity of four walls and a roof, a place to call home. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Faithful God, We give you thanks for the healing ministries of this congregation. Bless your servants as they visit the sick, listen to the lonely, pray for the suffering, 
craft quilts and prayer shawls as signs of your love, and bless those who labor without ceasing to care for loved ones with frailty of any kind. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. Renew our trust in your eternal promises of mercy, redemption, and new life. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name giving thanks for Christ who comes to us in this holy meal. Holy God, our bread of life, our table and our food, you created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want, and by this bread and cup, make us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Gathered and scattered in our homes though we may be, at this meal today we come together as one church, united with the church of every time and place. If you have been able to gather bread and wine, or if you have but wine or bread alone, please share it now with those gathered around you, or share it with me. This is the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Amen.